Well, hello. I'm Gretchen Sable, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Anoka, Blaine, Coon Rapids area. We work in all of Anoka County and northern Hennepin County to provide information for voters and other citizens <laughs> on important issues. Today I'm here with Paul Linnell, and we're doing a primer on the presidential primary. The presidential primary is going to be a different kind of election than we're used to in Anoka or in Minnesota, and so we want to talk about some of those differences and um, and help people understand that it will be not business as usual. Exactly. Um, Paul is the election coordinator, election manager Elections for Anoka, manager, correct for Anoka County. For Anoka County, um, and this is his first big election with the county, right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, just. Uh, took over the position full time in uh, March of this year. So we've got uh, school district elections under our belt from last year and things went, uh, uh, went very well in, in 2019 and quickly we'll be jumping into a very busy 2020 um, with a county commissioner special election in February and then uh, the presidential nomination primary for the entire county and the entire state on, mm -hmm. uh, on March 3rd. Yeah, so a lot going on. Um, I, I'd like to talk some about the presidential primary and how that's going to be happening and how it takes place of caucuses. So I'll just kind of let you go for a while and then we can chat more. Sure. So uh, most Minnesotans who have uh, you know, participated in the presidential nomination process are used to going to their precinct caucuses to participate in maybe a more informal vote um, to indicate their preference for um, which, which candidate they wanted to advance in their party's nomination process. Um, for those that participated in 2016 or maybe even in, in previous years, um, you might remember that process being very busy, uh, crowded. Uh, the caucuses take place at a single time on a single date. Um, so for, for folks that wanted to get out finding parking and, and getting in line on a cold February day presented a number of challenges. Um, challenges for both the voters as well as the parties who were administering that process. They relied on a number of volunteers and, and uh, uh, you know, staff to be able to administer and put on such a big event. So following the 2016 caucuses, the legislature passed um, a law that would change the nomination process from taking place in the caucuses um, to holding a full presidential nomination primary election. So this will much more closely resemble the type of election that voters are used to in the state of Minnesota. Um, there'll be a full election day voting with the polls open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Tuesday, March 3rd. Uh, there will be the full 46 days of absentee voting, so voters can come in in person um, or request a ballot to be sent to them by mail um, during that 46-day period. So it, it much uh, you know, expands greatly the opportunities for voters to participate in this process, particularly those that, you know, if you worked at 7 p.m. on that caucus night, you weren't able okay. to find a way to, um, to participate there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this should be a much more open way and more people can participate, and that'll be good. Um, there were questions about whether the caucuses still happen and there will still be caucuses. So it, I think that that's something that surprises people too. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because there there's much more to the caucus and the caucus process than just um, the presidential preference um, mm -hmm. you know, part of, of that, that event. Um, so all of the regular party business that would take place um, on that night, um, voting for delegates to move on to the state and national conventions, um, supporting certain party policy positions, um, all of that will, will still take place and that is the Tuesday prior to the presidential nomination primary. Oh, okay. um, so one week before that the caucuses will still take place at, at 7 p.m. Um, for the, the major parties that, that opt to hold the, their, okay. their caucuses. Hmm. So um, one thing I want to come back to is how people can vote absentee in early voting. So we'll hit that toward the end. Mm -hmm. um, so this, I ha I'm looking at material right now from League of Women Voters and from the Secretary of State. So we'll just kind of ask some questions from these. Sure. The, the nominating primary then is a way that we're going to develop who the candidates are. Are the parties bound by this vote, do you know? Um, no, so the, the winners of the um, primary in the state of Minnesota, that will bind the delegates, the, I believe the parties can choose whether the, that will bind um, their delegates to move on to the, the next level, to the national level for, mm -hmm. um, for each of the parties. And not all parties are actually required to participate in the presidential oh. nomination primary. They, they have the option um, as to whether they will be um, putting forward candidates and, and we expect that um, 
you know, the, the major parties will be moving mm -hmm. forward. In Minnesota now, there are four major political parties following the 2018 elections. So um, the Democratic Farmer Labor Party, the Republican Party, the Grassroots Legalized Cannabis Party, and the Legal Marijuana Now Party um, are all, um, all have the option to be able to put forward candidates that will be on the ballot on, on March 3rd. Mm -hmm. um, so then the, the winner of that um, election will then indicate to the party that, that the state of Minnesota's delegates will um, go according to, to that vote. Um, the parties also have the option to include an uncommitted spot on the ballot. So if voters um, are not yet ready to support a certain candidate, they may have the option to, to vote that they are uncommitted at that time, that they wish um, the delegates not to be bound mm -hmm. um, and, and to be able to go to the national convention um, uncommitted to a specific candidate. Okay. Um, hmm. So maybe it'd be a good time to walk through kind of what will happen when you go to the polling place. So these would be our regular polling places. And, and you were talking about just going through a school board election. And Correct. we know that when that happens, we all go to different places. And that's always confusing. So now for this, we're going to go back to our regular precinct polling places. Yes, exactly. So the, the majority of voters across Anoka County will be at the same polling place that they voted at for the 2018 state primary and 2018 general election. Um, occasionally, there are changes to a polling mm -hmm. place if a building is no longer available or if the space, sure. um, you know, something has changed. So uh, all of the municipalities are passing resolutions to designate their polling places for 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, are due by December 31st of, of this year and most cities have already um, passed okay. those designations. So um, if a voter goes to the Secretary of State's website um, through mnvotes.org, they can use the polling place finder mm -hmm. um, and look up where their polling place will be for election day. So it um, it, it will be, you know, that, that regular polling place that, that you um, likely had gone to in, in 2018, but you can always go to confirm uh, where that specific location is for Are the for voters day. notified of that? Do they get a card? I know some people get cards in the mail. Correct, yeah. So voters are only notified if their polling place changes. So okay. if, if you're voting at the same location as you did in 2018, mm -hmm. you won't receive anything, you know, a postcard through, um, through the mail saying this is your polling place for the upcoming mm -hmm. Um, March 3rd presidential nomination primary. But if your polling place has changed, there is a requirement in law that voters be notified of that change. So postcards will be sent to those households if there has been a, a change in polling place. At least 25 days prior to the election, okay. those voters will be notified. And also if they move into an area, then they would get a card saying that they're registered? As soon as their registration goes through. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and there are um, a growing number of ways in which voters can, can register to vote. And we encourage, while Minnesota is a, a state that has same day election mm -hmm. day registration. We encourage voters, um, you know, if you have moved or if you've had a name change, um, do update that registration as soon as possible. That that's easier to get your you know your record updated and, mm -hmm. and not have to deal with um, the added time on, on election day. So if you're able to, if you do move, you can register uh, online at the Secretary of State site, probably the easiest way mm -hmm. um, to do it. Or if you're updating your driver's license, you can check that box at the, the DMV to uh, get that update. If you're doing a change of address through mm -hmm. the United States Postal Service, that information can, can come back to oh, our okay. office to update your, mm -hmm. your information. So those are some of the main ways. Of course, still the you know, paper voter registration applications. If you're uh, out and about and there's a voter registration drive or if you stop into the county office or, or at one of your cities, they'll have voter registration forms to be filled out. Um, those come back to us and we'll get those mm -hmm. processed as well. So lots of ways to, to get registered. Yeah. So like Paul said, just to reiterate, you can register on election day and lots of people do that. I've worked as an election judge and we get a pretty good business, especially for a, a big election of people coming in. But pre-registering is usually easier and it makes things simpler on election day. So Absolutely, yeah. So there's a, a cutoff, they call it the pre-registration cutoff, which takes place 20 days prior to mm -hmm. election day. So those are the names that will appear on the roster. So in Anoka County, we now have electronic poll books. Um, so if you do complete your voter registration prior to those 20 days, your name will be on the list, on the poll book of registered voters. So it, mm -hmm. it speeds up the process on election day if you're, if you're going to vote at your polling place. Uh, but if you didn't get your registration in prior to that, that 20 day cutoff, um, you just need to provide one of the required proofs of residence, which can be a, a, a valid and current Minnesota driver's license with your current name and address, or you know, a number of other um, mm -hmm. identification documents, including expired or out-of-state um, photo IDs in combination with a bill or mm -hmm. a, um, you know, a, 
uh, lease statement. So yeah, those basically are, you have to prove that you're you and you're here. Exactly. And then of course there's always the um, if you, if you, um, you know, just moved in and you don't have one of those documents, uh, but your your neighbor next door knows mm -hmm. that you've just uh, settled in, in into that house, they can vouch for you if, mm -hmm. if they are a voter that's already registered in the same precinct. I'm always happy that we live in Minnesota where we have all these different ways to participate and there's not cutoffs that keep people from voting. So it, it's really nice to know that, yeah, we, when you know, we run into those issues on Election Day, our election judges across Anoka County and, and staff at the cities and at the county that work in election administration, um, you know, we'll do everything we can to make sure that, that all options are exhausted before a voter is, is ever turned away. And the Election Day registration um, really helps to make that process simpler to not not have to know that you know if you didn't get your your info in 30 days prior or 20 mm -hmm. days prior as some some other states have that that you might not be able to um, yeah. to get your ballot cast so so back to the so we're going to just show up like a regular election then at the polling place and what's going to change next or what's what, what's going to happen next yeah so the the biggest difference that i think voters will see with the presidential nomination primary compared to a, a regular election um, is, is going to be you know that first point when you do get to the the poll book and you provide the judge with your information they'll, they'll get you checked in the voter will need to select um, which party they intend to vote for the candidate of that party so um, with the the presidential nomination primary unlike other elections in minnesota not all voters will receive the same ballot mm -hmm. so when you get to your um, check-in process the election judge will turn around the the poll book screen and you'll have the options for all of the parties that will be participating in the in the PNP um, to select which party's ballot you mm -hmm. would like. Um, that will will print out a voter receipt that you'll then take to the the ballot judge after you've signed your your voter certificate, which will have all of the regular aspects of the voter oath, but also an additional line saying I am in in general agreement and support the the principles of of this party. I'll you know have to check the exact wording on that, but yeah. essentially you are um, you know ag agreeing with with the party that that you're mm -hmm. planning to cast a ballot for. So you'll take that receipt over to the the ballot judge. Um, and they'll have the ballots for each of the parties um, in a way that's concealed so that other voters um, and others around the polling place won't know which party's ballot you're receiving, trying to emphasize privacy and confidentiality as this um, selection is being made. So um, when that receipt is given to the, the ballot judge, they'll um, look through, grab the ballot for the party that the voter selected and, and issue it to, to the voter there. Mm -hmm. So the, the voter's choice when they get their ballot, of course, remains private will, will never um, be shared, but that, that um, preference for which party's ballot they, they want to receive, that is recorded um, in the, the electronic roster and then loaded into the uh, statewide voter registration system. Mm -hmm. um, it is private data, so it's not shared, it's not publicly available and cannot be requested um, by, by anyone um, as you know, other aspects of a voter's record might be, but the, um, only the chairs of the four major political parties will receive um, that, that preference data, mm -hmm. that, that information about what party the voter has, has selected. So mm -hmm. once they get their, um, their ballot, they'll take it to the, you know, the voting booth and complete the process just the same as, um, as they normally had. Mm -hmm. As we touched on briefly, there might be a few differences depending on which party's ballot they uh, opt to receive and how the parties approach um, which candidates they put forward on the ballot. Um, so, as we discussed, they, they do, the parties do have the option to put an uncommitted spot on the ballot. They also have the option to put a, a write-in spot on the ballot, so that's something voters might be used to. But depending on which party uh, they vote for or how the parties approach you know, what, mm -hmm. what they want to put on the ballot, it might look, look yeah. differently. I think it's going to feel funny to people to see, to see such a strong involvement from the parties in choosing how an election works. Yeah, and I think that's interesting because I, it, one thing to keep in mind is, is this really is a, a party process, mm -hmm. I think, more than it is a, a conventional election. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that was the same as we saw through the, the caucus system. This is a, you know, uh, candidates aren't being elected to an office through this election. They mm -hmm. are, they're moved forward in a party uh, nomination process. So it's, it's, I think, kind of intertwining a traditional election with that party process and in a way that that helps to you know, make it easier for for the voters and mm -hmm. and so it'll probably be a, a little bit of a learning curve around you know how this is is more of a unique exercise compared to mm -hmm. um, you know what voters might be used to but because it is taking the part the place of that pri the caucus 
it's important that the party be able to structure it in a way that works for their process moving forward. Exactly, yeah, and I think that's kind of where the, the national parties had indicated that, that in order to hold a, a primary like this, the, the, the state parties would have to <coughs> in some way capture that, that mm -hmm. data of, of who it is that's, that's coming to um, indicate they want a ballot for that, that mm -hmm. party. So that was, I think, a requirement before they moved forward with, with that legislation initially in 2016. And then there was a bit of a compromise in, in this um, legislative session to make that change that the a voter's preference would not be public data, but would rather only be um, provided to the chairs of, of the parties. Mm -hmm. And that's to all the four major parties. Correct. So um, what if you're a minor party? How would they choose their yeah, I, I believe you know that would still be through the the same the process system. that they had gone through. If mm -hmm. they still have their their party caucus, that they would go um, in that direction. But it, it does the law does require that um, mm -hmm. it, the the parties be of major party status, and there was an additional. Um, provision added to in this legislative session that um, in addition to being a major party, they have to have a national nominating convention to be able oh, okay. to participate. So mm -hmm. um, you know, something that moves the delegates mm -hmm. forward as part of a, a okay. national process. So like in Minnesota, we'd had the Independence Party was a major party for a while because they got 5% of the vote I think that's in a statewide yeah. election. And now they haven't reached, reached that threshold again. So mm -hmm. they're not on this party ballot. Correct. Yep. So anyone primary. that's below that threshold or that didn't qualify as a major party would, would not be, would not have um, a ballot at the, yeah. the nomination primary. Mm -hmm. huh. Okay. So then you, you vote and you just put your ballot into the voting machine just like always and you get your I voted sticker and you're done. And, and that's the the process, right? Exactly, yep, so that would complete it for election day voting. Um, so, you know, we can jump into absentee. Yeah, uh, let's do that. So I want to start with how you get a, an absentee ballot and how soon can you get that. So like a lot of people are snowbirds mm -hmm. and they're gone from the state for a longer period of time than the period during early voting. Yeah, and we've started to receive questions at our office, you know, for the last mm -hmm. several weeks and, and going back a while now of, you know, when are things going to be available for the, the presidential nomination primary? How do I apply if I want to vote early? The, um, again, probably the easiest way to do it is, is going to be online at the Secretary of State's website. If you want a ballot sent to you by mail or if you know you're, you're headed out of town, um, the online application just opened, I think, the middle, of, middle to end of November. So okay. voters can go to the Secretary of State site and complete that, that online application. Um, so that will get all of your, your data added into the into the system, kind of mm -hmm. queue it up for the start of the absentee period. So any applications that are received now through January 16th, that's the, the day prior. January 17th is the start of absentee voting. So ballots will, will be sent out to all voters on, on that day that have been, you know, have and applied. And they would be sent to your point. place in Arizona or Florida or wherever you're going. Correct. So a voter can, can opt to have an absentee ballot mailed to their, their residence at, at home, or if they're going to be away or, mm -hmm. or have another uh, address they'd like that ballot sent to, they can indicate where they want that, that ballot to be. What if they're going to Costa to? Rica? Can they go to another country? Yes, they can. So okay. it's, it's a, a separate process for voters um, that are temporarily or permanently um, residing overseas. So for students that might be studying abroad okay. or for folks mm -hmm. that are in the military, um, it's called the Federal Postcard Application or they're also called uh, the, the UOCAVA, so Uniformed Overseas Citizens uh, AVA, uh, Assistance uh, in Voters Act, I yeah. believe. Um, so those, those voters um, apply through a slightly different um, portal, but they can mm -hmm. submit either a paper or an online uh, application and, and their, their ballots will be uh, issued as well. One um, separate process for those voters to help to speed line, uh, streamline and speed up the delivery of the ballots, we are able to email ballots to voters that are residing overseas. Oh. They do still need to return a physical mm -hmm. paper marked ballot, um, mm -hmm. but it does help on the front end with, uh, with the delivery. The state authorizes us to be able to, um, to transmit ballots electronically. So pretty much anywhere you are in the world, you can vote in this primary to, if you're a Minnesota resident. Correct, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's um, I think, as we talked about, you know, opening up the process for more people to participate mm -hmm. when you think about, you know, one, one night of the year at one point in time at one specific location to now, yeah. you know, anywhere in the world, as you said, uh, mm -hmm. starting up to 46 days uh, prior to the election, it, it makes, will I think, greatly expand um, participation in, in, in this event. Mm -hmm. um, 
similar to the election day check-in process for voters that are, are voting absentee on the application, they'll have to indicate which major party's ballot they, they would oh, like to receive. Yeah. So that's the point in time that they make that selection so that our office knows which, which ballot to send mm -hmm. to that voter. Mm -hmm. So let's see, what else should we talk about? The ballot, we talked about the ballots is going to, we don't know yet what the ballots are going to look like and who's going to be on each ballot. Right, it's, it's a bit of an unknown uh, at this point in time. The um, parties have until December 31st to certify to the Secretary of State's office um, what candidates' names will appear on the ballot and whether they'll have that uncommitted option or that write-in option. Mm -hmm. um, so it really is at the party's discretion, uh, the chairs of the parties in, in the state of Minnesota as to um, which names they want to have on there. So as, as soon as the secretary's office knows they will provide that information to our office so we can quickly turn that around, uh, program the ballots, and, and send that information off to our mm -hmm. ballot printer because it's a pretty short window yeah. of time before the start of absentee then uh, mm -hmm. on the 17th of January. Um, if my preferred candidate wins the nominating primary for my party, does that guarantee they'll be on the general election ballot? It does not. So, you know, Minnesota is is one of 50 states and, and part of a you know, much broader nomination mm -hmm. process for the major parties. So I'm sure, you know, folks are, are seeing in the news and, and maybe in ads on, on border towns on, on Iowa, which is the first in the, the nation caucus, um, that kind of kickstarts the, the nomination process for mm -hmm. Uh, the parties. So as the delegates are awarded through um, each of the states, either caucuses or, or primaries, that starts to build up their totals. And you know, as you get towards the summer and, and towards the, the nominating conventions, um, you'll probably have an idea at that point in time which of the candidates are, are going to advance. But um, no guarantees that the winner in Minnesota yeah. for, for any of the parties will, will be the one that ultimately lands on the ballot mm -hmm. for the general election uh, in November. And just like every other election, you have to be 18 to vote in this, right? Correct, yeah. And, and a uh, citizen. That's correct, yep. So uh, 18 on election day. If you will turn 18 on or before March 3rd, you can uh, still request an absentee ballot a ahead oh, okay. of time as long as you're eligible um, you know, by that, that March 3rd cutoff date. Mm -hmm. And just like other elections, you still have the right to get time off to vote? Yes, exactly. That same, same law applies, so um, employers are required to give that, that accommodation, make sure that their employees do have um, the ability to, to vote that day. So as um, election official, you're in charge of all the election judges that run these. Are you looking to hire more election judges? So I know uh, we hear from our, our city clerks, so in the, the even year elections, the cities do uh, all of the direct hiring of election judges for their polling places. Um, uh, and, and some have indicated that this, this election in particular has, has proven challenging um, for recruitment. They've had, uh, you know, some of their election judges, their mainstays for the last several decades have, have indicated their They've served their time and they're, mm -hmm. they're ready to, um, to hand it over to a new generation. Um, additionally, uh, an election in March, that's, that's still a point in time where some folks would, would rather be outside of the state of Minnesota enjoying mm -hmm. warmer weather if they've got a, a vacation place. That's one thing about Minnesota, we got plenty of winter. You can be here up to January and come back in April and there's still winter for it's you. <laughs> never ending, seemingly, or, or starting early. Yeah. Um, so I, I know that there are, you know, with, with that kind of base of, of judges uh, you know, being maybe a little bit um, shallower than, than usual, there's, there's a need uh, to recruit some new judges, mm -hmm. in particular um, you know, younger judges and, and folks that might be interested in engaging in the process for the first time. Um, there's uh, an option for student election judges. So for folks that are still in high school, uh, 16 or 17 year olds um, are able to participate as a student election judge. Um, and I know that's something that a number of our cities are hoping to uh, increase going into mm -hmm. to this year. So um, additionally, folks that speak multiple languages, in, especially in certain locations, to have th that skill set uh, is very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, with the transition to electronic poll books, it, it has made the process, I think, a little more streamlined for judges to administer on election day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and Anoka County does provide training for all, all election judges, so you'll be certified and prepared to work on election day. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I think it's, there's no better way to engage in the democratic process and, and to better understand the electoral process than to participate as an election judge. A lot of times, you know, we get questions at our office about how a certain uh, law or procedure functions and, and our um, you know, responses as we, after we help to explain that to the voters to say, you know, if you 
you know, are, are sounds like you're interested in, would love to, to learn more about it, you know, definitely sign up. I think that's, mm -hmm. and, and people have developed a sense of community through their election judge service. There's, there's um, you know, good friendships that have been mm -hmm. forged across party lines and, and um, with a, a true commitment to administering, you know, effective elections in their, their polling place. Mm -hmm. um, so Paul just mentioned across party lines. There's a lot of functions of an election judge where you have to say, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican, because both parties are required to be represented in certain functions of election judges. That's correct. Yeah, there are, are certain um, functions that election judges carry out that require um, major party affiliation for those, mm -hmm. those judges. So um, judges are often encouraged, if they do have a party affiliation, to make that known when they're applying uh, to the cities. Um, the parties will also share election judge information to the cities that helps with their hiring process. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll have a list of, um, as you said, Democratic or Republican. People or, that sign up at caucus, basically. Correct, yeah. So yeah. They'll, they'll have, um, you know, lists of election judges to, to pull from. But, um, you know, as they're carrying out their duties on election day, it's, it's not, you know, usually openly shared. It's, it's co private yeah. information for the head judge to know mm -hmm. as far as assigning those specific duties. Mm -hmm. um, but, but all functions are really carried out, you know, fully neutral and absent of, of any sort of affiliation. Mm -hmm. it's yeah, you always start your day with a pledge to be neutral and fair exactly. in administering the election. And I think Minnesotans take pride in, in the fact that we, we do have, um, you know, a very sound and, and successful election mm -hmm. system here. And, and there's, a, um, I think, a tradition to uphold that in, in the polling place, in the absentee process. And, um, and I think we're all proud of the, the work we do. So, and we'd love to have mm -hmm. more uh, join, join those ranks. Yeah, so this is, but this, just so you know, there is only one question on this election. So there'd be a quick to vote in, but we still need a full complement of election judges to put it on. That's exactly right. Yeah, the, uh, the ballot itself will be you know, pretty small. You're gonna just yeah. have the one contest for, for the uh, office of the president, but um, all of the functions still remain the same. So you need judges to um, you know, make sure voters are at the right place, to check mm -hmm. in voters, register voters that are, are registering on mm -hmm. election day, issue the ballots. Um, so it, it, we expect it'll be a fairly robust turnout and, and think that we'll need a full complement of judges mm -hmm. across the polling places in, in Anoka County. Well, thanks. Um, we're going to take a short break here. We'll come back with some questions. Sounds great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I wore this throughout my chemo treatment. I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Organizations like Leukemia Lymphoma Society give patients like me that hope. LLS-funded research has led to nearly every blood cancer treatment available today and to treatments for many other kinds of cancer. Beating cancer is in our blood. This isn't about class. This isn't about gender. This isn't about where you live or which party you support. It's about promoting and providing access to the arts for everyone. Goes to local theaters, music programs, art exhibits. This is about supporting fifth grade talent shows around the country. This is about what makes us laugh. <laughs> what makes us dance. I'm still funky. What makes us think. The arts gave me a career, arguably. <laughs> We are all empowered by the art that surrounds us every day. Arts funding is empowering communities all over the United States. Not just big cities. This is about the thread that connects all of us. Art has the power to move us. Art has the power to empower. The arts empower us to be who we are. Wishes for your future in a world that's changing fast. Do play and laugh. Do win and lose. Do it all with confidence, kindness, and strength. And always do your best to remember that no matter what you do in this life, what matters to me is that you keep doing. Okay, welcome back. Um, when we were meeting, when we were talking before, I forgot to say that this is part one of a two-part series of events. So we have this cable show that people are going to be able to watch, but Paul's going to appear live at the Northtown Library on January 4th at 1.30. So if you want to talk more about this in person, come down to the Northtown Library and meet with Paul and I, and we can 
talk about all your questions. But for now, we have some students, studio audience questions. Um, let's see. Uh, there's a lot of concern here about um, privacy. Will my party preference in the presidential primary become public information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's going to be something that we emphasize in our training to our our clerks and, and election judges as far as the interactions with with a voter, and, you know, whether it be absentee or, or on election day, that um, you know discretion is is um, is carried out, and, and that the voters preference is, is not known. You know, it'll be a, a check bo checkbox on the absentee application and it'll be something that they, they press in the polling place uh, on the electronic poll book. And, and mm -hmm. so there shouldn't be, you know, an option for, for others and the voters to, to really know who, who that voter is um, choosing for their party preference. After election day, um, you know, that, that information is um, tied into their, the voters' history, but because of the, the law change in 2019, that, that will remain private data, so it's not available for, for anyone to request. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, passed along only to the chairs of the, the four major political parties mm -hmm. uh, post-election day. So um, that, that, that's um, a component, that, as, as we touched on, is, is I think part of the requirement from the national parties um, for them to be able to, to hold the nomination primary, that that information be, be available to those, those party chairs. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as, as far as questions or concerns about what the parties will do with that information after they get that, um, you know, voters are, are welcome to, to contact the parties and, and mm -hmm. you know, see what, what will be done with, with that information. But beyond that, it's not publicly available data. That's the same as when you go to your caucus. Everybody knows who you are because you have to sign in. And so... That's exactly right. So, yeah, I think the, the caucus process, you know, the, the language is, is more or less the same as far mm -hmm. as being in agreement with the principles of the party and signing signing that oath. So when voters would participate in the nomination process at the caucus, they were signing in and providing that information to the parties. So it really does mirror, um, you know, what, what had taken place uh, mm -hmm. through, through that process. Here's a question. So if somebody wants to see what's going to be on their ballot, where would they find that information and when? So that information will be available on the, the Secretary of State's website. So as mm -hmm. soon as we get the information about which candidates the parties are mm -hmm. um, proposing to have on the ballot, we will program those, those ballots and get them okay. off to the printer. So I would say by the uh, you know, middle part of, of the second week of January, maybe the, the seventh or eighth or so, we should have that, that data uploaded to okay. the Secretary of State's website so a voter can go um, you know, enter their address information and get the ballot that's specific to, um, to their individual precinct. So okay. that information will be known early part of, of 2020 once the parties mm -hmm. finalize their, their candidates. Okay. Um. So there will, we, we don't know yet that, so looking at your ballot, that would be when you'd find out if there's going to be a write-in option or uncommitted options. And we won't know until then, or at least until the end of December. That's exactly right. Yeah, I know some parties have, have uh, started to give some indication as to, um, you know, what, what candidate names or how their, um, their ballots might appear. But um, until that 31st deadline passes, we won't know uh, definitively what, okay. what will be on those, those ballots. So you talked some about the national process. Is a primary the way most states do this? I, that's correct. I know um, a majority of states do um, award their delegates through through the primary. I think for similar reasons as as we've discussed, you know, having a more um, open process, one that that allows for more wider participation mm -hmm. and and more closely resembles the election day experience. Um, there are still a handful of states that do have um, do their nomination process through the caucus system, as we touched on Iowa, uh, Nevada, and, and some of the others. So it's mm -hmm. um, kind of tradition and, and what what process has been put in place. But um, certainly, as Minnesota is, is demonstrating, open to new ideas or evolution into mm -hmm. how we're um, uh, participating in, in this process. So, you know, this is really the first time since 1992, and the first uh, time, and even longer than that, I think, in a full. Um, you know, with, with all of the parties participating in a, a nomination primary. So there's, there's a lot of unknowns and, and mm -hmm. we'll probably learn a lot from uh, this exercise here in, in 2020 and, and hopefully be able to apply that to, you know, potential improvements yeah. uh, th the next time around. But we're, we're optimistic that, that this will be, you know, something that the voters uh, um, like to, you know, participate in and, and will open up their options mm -hmm. um, as compared to the previous model. Yeah. Um, last question, is there still time to become an election judge? For this pro Absolutely. Yeah. So we encourage you, uh, you know, 
contact your, your city clerk, mm -hmm. contact your cities. They'll uh, have applications and information about becoming an election judge. There's also um, you know, some information on the Secretary of State site around duties and some of the things that you might expect to uh, be responsible for on election mm -hmm. day. But I know, uh, I think across the board, we're still looking to fill out our ranks. So uh, you know, March 3rd, if you've got the time and, and you're interested in learning more about the election process, um, we'd love to, to have you mm -hmm. uh, sign up and, and participate as, yeah. as an election judge. Yeah, you know, having been an election judge, it, it's a long day, and so there is kind of that feature of having to work a long day, but it's, it's a lot of fun. You get to uh, visit with your neighbors, and you get to make good friends, and so I really, I've enjoyed my stints as election judge, and uh, I would advocate for it, so there, that's a little commercial. And good potlucks too, right? <laughs> and most places have potlucks. <laughs> Not that you have much time to eat, especially in a busy presidential Ex year. Exactly. Yeah, but, but it's fun. Um, so I think that'll do it again. You know, on January 4th, we're going to be having the session. And so it's, it, I'd love to see people come down to Northtown and chat with us 1.30 on January 4th. Um, just an informal chit-chat. And um, that'll do it. Thanks a lot, Paul. Thank you.